Hello, and welcome to Working for the Word. My name is Andrew Case, and this is where we talk about Bible translation. This is the beginning of a special project that's going to span across several episodes. Basically, this is what I spent the last year of my life doing, and I want to share with you some of these amazing things that were part of what we call an oral scripture adaptation experiment. Now, the advance of globalization among the minority languages of the world is rapidly changing the landscape of Bible translation. You have to know that. Though a complete written Bible is a worthy goal, in some cases, the declining vitality of minority languages and lack of mother tongue literacy makes this approach impractical. By the time the completed Bible is published, there may be few left to read it, and that's the problem. So, when we faced this reality, my wife and I, among the Fang people of Equatorial Guinea, and observed a very low interest in the existing written Fang New Testament, we began an experimental oral adaptation of portions of the Old Testament. And this is the story. So I invite you to join us on this journey. We basically took narrative passages of the Old Testament and worked with people to translate them orally from Spanish into Fang. We worked with a gifted storyteller and presented it in the traditional Fang troubadour style, which is called Inverayung. And with all this, we included traditional music and rhythms. The resulting recordings have been really positively received by the community. And so I want to share this detailed, let's call it a report, as an alternative and innovative model for other language groups who may be facing similar circumstances. So let's get into it. Let's get into some of the background circumstances for this project. Let's talk a little bit about the Fang language first. Fang is a Bantu language with 589,000 native speakers, more or less, in Central Africa, ranging from southern Cameroon, throughout Equatorial Guinea, and into Gabon. The Fang are traditionally jungle dwellers of the interior and are the most numerous of several people groups in continental EG. So I'm going to be referring to Equatorial Guinea as EG from now on. And they dominate the coastal minority peoples. There are two main dialects of Fang in EG, Okak in the south and Ntumu in the north, which have many phonological and lexical differences but are mostly mutually intelligible, similar to how we might think of British English and American English. Now the official and educational language of the country is Spanish, and all local languages have been prohibited in schools since the period of Spanish colonization. The country gained its independence in 1968, but the Spanish language remains dominant, and there is no mother tongue education, sadly. French is also widely used because they are surrounded by French countries, French-speaking countries. Now, there is no tradition of writing Fang, and orthography was developed by expats for the publication of the New Testament, and literacy in Spanish is reportedly high, 77%, according to the ethnologue, especially among the urban population. There are significant linguistic differences between the coastal city of Bata, where we lived, where I lived the last seven years of my life, and the rural interior of the country. Now once you venture into the interior of the country, Fong use is much more ubiquitous, where the older generations and many women are still monolingual Fong speakers. But the problem is most of the interior has no schools beyond a middle school level. So all the youth who want to go do higher education have to relocate to large cities like Bata or Ebebiyin, in some cases Malabo, which is on an island, which is the capital city, where Spanish is rapidly becoming dominant. So then you've got the situation in Bata, where children speak almost exclusively Spanish with each other, and mostly Spanish with their parents. I did a small survey back in 2019 with 50 adult Fang speakers, and 
I asked them the following question, among other questions. What language do your children usually speak with their friends? All except one responded with Spanish. And when asked the question, what language do you usually speak with your children? 47 out of 50 said Spanish. So there's a huge decline. A more extensive survey of the language vitality was also performed in 2019 by Susana Castillo Rodriguez, who's a PhD from State University of New York. And she collected 1,700 answers all over continental EG, and the results are still pending, but in a personal communication with her, she said that her overall impressions were that Spanish was quickly displacing Fong as the first language of most children and youth. In general, the head leaders of local church denominations and networks live in Bata and preach in Spanish to congregations of mixed ethnicities, whereas the rural pastors they oversee are much more likely to preach in Fong. So that's the church situation. While most churches still sing some percentage of their worship songs in Fang, especially in the interior, no evangelical church that I'm aware of is using traditional instruments in their worship. The xylophone and traditional drums began to disappear from evangelical churches beginning in the 1970s, replaced by Western keyboards and guitars and drum sets, sadly, because they actually have really beautiful traditional instruments. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of Bible translation in Fang in this country. A complete Bible translation in Bulu, a variety of Fang spoken in southern Cameroon, was published in 1940. Many Fang Christians in EG learned to read it, but the dialectical difference made it difficult to understand. It's only really used by a few individuals today, and its orthography is not used elsewhere in EG. Now, the New Testament in the Fang of EG was published in 2014 by the National Bible Translation Organization, ACTB. That's what it's called. Now, Unfortunately, there was little to no local church involvement in the translation process and no community celebration of its publication, which you usually see, you know, in those videos, you see the whole community come out and they have a big party and dedication of the new translation. Well, that didn't happen. Now, some copies were distributed and sold, but since that time, it has been used very, very little in the local churches. These churches mainly use what we call the Reina Valera 1960 Spanish version. Now, beginning in 2015, SIL made a scripture app available, which I designed and developed, which included a large amount of the audio recording of the New Testament. So I spent about a year of my life making the audio available, which is a huge undertaking. If you've ever recorded a whole New Testament in a new language with people who are not used to reading their language, it's a huge undertaking. So we got it done, made an app with it, really cool, syncs with the audio and the text and scrolls automatically and almost teaches you to read. But despite all the promotional work with local churches and advertising, the app has been received with limited interest, to say it nicely. <laughs> now, even though I put an analytics tracker in the app, it's hard to estimate exactly how many people are actively using the app because of limited internet connectivity in the country. But based on the little data that has been uploaded, there are only two to three people who actively use the app. So, yeah, that's pretty discouraging. Now, fast forward to the summer of 2018, where we designed a new version of the Fong Scripture app, which included the Reina Valera as an optional parallel interlinear version. So, really cool. It had other updated features, so they could select to have the Reina Valera Spanish 
along with the Fong as interlinear or as parallel windows within the app and they would scroll together automatically and thought maybe this would generate more interest so I published this on Google Play and launched a targeted online advertise, advertising campaign targeting EG, Cameroon, Spain, and Gabon. Over a thousand people downloaded the app but the retention rate was horrible. It was abysmal. So that means that most users uninstalled the app right after downloading it. The app currently remains installed on only 94 phones. The last time I checked it's probably lower now because that was months and months ago that I checked. So what I think happened is that many people who speak the dialects of Fang from Gabon and Cameroon where they have a lot of internet access and are more accustomed to downloading apps from the App Store thought that the app was a version of the New Testament in their dialect but were disappointed when they tried to use it and so after six months of advertising targeting other countries we changed the target to EG only. The result was that downloads virtually came to a standstill and remained so until we discontinued the advertising. Now, when asking Fong speakers why they believe the New Testament has been so poorly received, many reasons are given, ranging from the translation being unnatural and difficult to understand, to the Okak and Ntumu dialects being oddly mixed in different features of the orthography and that was intentional. The translators who worked on this thought it best to try to make a hybrid orthography that mixed the two different dialects into one so that it could be relatively accessible to everyone which results in a f kind of fang that represents no actual speaker. One of the most frequent comments is that learning to read Fong is difficult. And that's another excuse that comes up. Now let's talk about literacy. What went on with the attempts to get people to learn how to read their language? Well, there were some consistent literacy efforts on the part of expats in Bata and Evinayong, a small city in the interior, between roughly 2004 and 2011. Now these mainly consisted of the creation of primers and one-time workshops at churches focusing on transferring Spanish literacy skills to Fang. So basically you take people who already can read Spanish and you help them bridge that into reading their own language. Then in 2016, a colleague of mine who served temporarily with SIL created an app to help users learn to read Fang. It was really, really well done, but again, interest and distribution have been limited. There were also workshops to train the leadership of ACTB to train other literacy teachers, but these classes did not continue after the expats left. And so there are no longer any consistent and ongoing Fong literacy efforts in the country. Now, it appears that Apart from a few individuals, the Fong are not interested in a foreign motivated agenda of literacy, but are content for Fong to remain oral, as always. In the same way, it seems that a Fong Bible was never a significant felt need on the part of the community. It was at best a generated need, or what one author, Hill Harriet Hill, defines as when a community does not feel the need for a translation of the Bible in their language, but the Bible translation representative convinces them of the need. This is the weakest motivation of all, but still can result in a successful program, as long as those involved invest much more effort in stimulating and sustaining interest. Now, unfortunately, this key condition of sustained community interest and involvement was not met during the translation process, and local opinion leaders were not successfully engaged. Sadly, the result has been a largely unused New Testament translation. 
And this is one of the sad realities of Bible translation around the world. This happens, and it happens probably more often than you would like to think. So this is all stuff building up to the time where I arrived on the scene. And I want to comment a little more on what the young people are like nowadays there. They eagerly pursue a future in which economic and educational opportunities are linked to Spanish, French, and English. So those are the three languages for them that mean money, that mean success, that mean rising to the top out of poverty or whatever. And they seem mostly unconcerned that Fong may gradually fade into the past. So I eventually concluded that a written Fong Old Testament, a written one, was not a strategic goal. Because by the time it would be published, it would serve only as a cultural museum piece for future generations who will speak more Spanish or French than Fong. Even if you finished this quickly, it is unlikely that it would be widely accepted and used given the current disuse of the New Testament and apathy towards Fang literacy. So those were key elements. And as we mentioned before, urban churches, which are often multi-ethnic, have a strong preference for Spanish scripture and preaching. Many churches feel that exclusive use of Fang in their services would exclude their minority members, so members of the minority languages. And so, although there is often an interpretation into Fang, nearly all urban churches use Spanish. When the scriptures are read in Spanish, they are interpreted into Fang on the spot, or, as often as not, left untranslated altogether. Years of personally encouraging pastors to use the Fong New Testament in their services affected little, if any, change. My colleagues and I worked and worked and worked to try to cast a vision for this, and it affected little, if any, change. So, I concluded that it is not my role to spend decades of my life trying to convince the Fong to use their mother tongue where they clearly do not want to. That's not my calling or purpose as a missionary, right? Uh, Harriet Hill notes that diglossic communities or communities that speak two languages may prefer scripture in the language of wider communication for public ceremonies and the mother tongue for home use. Better to identify or restrict domain in which mother tongue scriptures are appropriate and make the most of it than to try to promote mother tongue scriptures in larger domains where they aren't appropriate, end quote. So in the end, if Fong scriptures are not desirable for public services, perhaps they might be accepted in a different domain, which is traditional entertainment. Now, in order to reach people, I wanted to make scripture accessible to monolingual Fang speakers. But for this, it would need to be, number one, in a culturally relevant format, and number two, ready to share soon before the older generations disappear. So those two key things. If our communication of the scriptures is to be relevant to the target audience, it must naturally be in a format they consider relevant. As Sundersing writes in his really great book on audio-based translation, he says, The incarnational model demands that we be receptor-oriented in our communication. God reached us at our level, and that is the pattern to be employed in all Christian communication. End quote. Also, another guy, Fritz Gerling, writes, Recent concerns focus on the relevance of the translated scriptures. We cannot afford to ignore this issue. Otherwise, we end up with unused Bible translation. For translations to be perceived as relevant, they must meet the standards of meaningful communication centered on the message and focused on the audience." End quote. 
For a Fong audience, the format they considered most relevant is aural, not textual. As it turned out, the Fong already had a genre of oral performance that is perfectly suited for the long, long narratives of the Old Testament. This format is called Imbirayang. Surprisingly, no one had ever used the Imbirayang for anything to do with Christianity or the Bible. So let's talk about this Imbirayang and Fang tradition. For generations, the Fang have considered the performances of troubadours to be sacred and fundamental expressions of their culture. This is super important. As the introduction to a Spanish translation of one of these epics says, the Mvet is the deepest expression of the culture of the Fang people. So I'll be using these terms interchangeably, Mvet and Mverayung. So remember that it is the deepest, this, this tradition is the deepest expression of the culture of the Fang people. So once again, these narrative epics are called Mverayung, named for their trademark stringed instrument, the Mvet, which is the name of the whole instrument. And Oyung refers to a bamboo pole to which are attached three hollow gourds as resonance chambers and between one to four strings made of trapping wire. The center gourd is held against the abdomen with the bamboo center at a diagonal angle with the body while the strings are plucked with the fingertips and thumb, similar to a harp. I'll link, I'll be sure to link some videos of this in the show notes. Now in Mverayung, the storyteller's narration is accompanied by his own mvet, as well as a constant background rhythm made with bamboo sticks called bikwara, hit together by audience members. This sound resembles a metronome and is also accompanied by a bell rhythm that plays off of the bikwara bass. Now, if there is no bell available, an empty liquor bottle usually takes its place. There are intermittent musical choruses and audience participation with call and response phrases to help keep their attention. So all of these elements come together to comprise what makes this amazing epic storytelling style. Now I know it's hard to imagine what this sounds like without actually hearing it, so don't worry. I'm going to play lots of sample clips of what this is like. So that's coming up soon. Now these performances, which typically last for two to four hours, were originally presented at funerals of distinguished men. The troubadour would make veiled references to the life of the dead man in his story, including him as a character under a different name, while the audience tried to guess which character represented him. These stories tell of the exploits of their mythical ancestors, usually. The immortal Ekang, the clan of the mythical world of Engong. The Ekang are the mythical representation of the Fang, and the stories of, of Invet show us their virtues and defects, their values and their longings, their beliefs, and their way of seeing and conceiving of the world. The Ekang are a clan of recurring characters and every lover of Inverayung is familiar with the inhabitants of Engong, their personalities and how they are interrelated. The epics are set in present day with cars, telephones, presidential palaces, military personnel, and especially the ubiquitous military checkpoints providing fodder for humor. Now, the deeds of the Ekang are considered not to be the invention of the troubadours themselves, but rather are told to them by their spirits as stories brought from the land of the dead. So that's what these guys would say that they get their stories from the land of the dead.
and they do that through different kinds of mysterious witchcraft. So what kind of themes do these Mvirayung performances carry in these stories? Well, some of them can be lyrical or amorous, epic, and sometimes satirical, or stories about recent events even. They may contain veiled political commentaries, or be interpreted as such even when unintended, which has sometimes made the office of troubadour a perilous vocation because they could get in trouble with the government, for example. Now, they often include indirect moral or wisdom lessons that teach the principles and rules that people should follow if they want to live as humans and the defects that lead to the loss of the human being. The inhabitants of Ngong, this imaginary world, each with their strengths and weaknesses serve as memorable examples of how or how not to live. Now there's a tradition of leaving the story unfinished and always ending with the quote, we will continue tomorrow phrase, even when that's not the case. Now what's cool about this genre is that it's particularly appropriate for interpreting Old Testament passages because like the Hebrew Scriptures, the Inverion can include history, epic poetry, songs, and even genealogies. The troubadours sing their genealogies up until their ancestor, Afiri Kara, who is supposed to be the source of the name Africa, actually, and beyond. So, the translator for this project that we did, Acacio Mba, he can recite his own genealogy many generations back, naming God as the last link, which is really cool. He can just rattle it off. Now, since the Fang have a tradition of reciting or singing their direct line of ancestors, including during and very young performances, most of the genealogies in the Old Testament passages that were translated fit perfectly into the adaptations. Even the table of nations in Genesis 10 was put to rhythm and recorded separately like a song. Where we Westerners would see a genealogy as boring or tedious, they see an opportunity to have another song in their epic. Now, traditionally, the troubadours must be initiated with special and secret spiritual rites and teachings. A troubadour is often a descendant of other troubadours and must have a broad memory. And he's got to be gifted musically and poetically and be able to improvise. And by the way, this is only a, ma a man's thing. Troubadours are greatly admired and represent the essential character in the Fang oral tradition. Now, the most famous guy the most famous Mbomenbet, or troubadour, of recent years is a guy called Eyi Mondong. He was born in 1928. We believe he died in 2003. Many of his live performances were actually recorded and are still played on the radio and distributed today and enjoyed especially by the older generations. Mvirayang is now a disappearing art form, though there are a few storytellers still performing, notably one or more of Eyimondong's sons. Its decline may be due in part to the strong association of the Invet instrument with witchcraft. So that's, that's one of the problems. And it's also associated with human sacrifice to achieve the talent that they need. The crazy thing is that According to tradition, the very first guy who got this talent, the very first troubadour in their history, the condition for receiving his office was the sacrifice of his own mother. And since then, that has been understood as a typical requirement for anyone else who is going to become a famous troubadour. And the reason for that is so that their mother's can bring them stories from the land of the dead so that they get these epic stories from that place supernaturally. 
Acacio Mba, our translator, once owned an Mbet, but it was destroyed by his mother's sister for fear that he might end up making such a sacrifice. So this is real. It's still true today that people have this deep-set fear of the instrument and what's involved in this whole realm of epic performances. Few today actually wish to learn it because of the stigma and suspicion that may accompany it. So, But our hope is that this project can be a step toward redeeming this and other traditional instruments from their associations with witchcraft for a new use in worship of the true God and for communicating His truth. In various interviews with Acasio, he has said, the other troubadours get their stories by witchcraft from the land of the dead, but I don't get my stories that way. I get them from God himself in his word. So that wraps up the first part of this multi-episode journey, doing oral adaptation experimentation in Equatorial Guinea. Next time we're going to get into more of the guts of the project, what it was like, the people involved, and hear some clips of what we did. But for now let's close this and listen to an old, old recording of one of the most famous troubadours of Equatorial Guinea, the guy I mentioned earlier, Eyi Mondong, so you can hear what this would sound like. Now do I know much I don't know come my own phone I don't know what to do. I don't know what Go <laughs> All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others who might find it interesting and edifying. And if you would, please leave a review. That's a really great way to help keep the podcast going. Here at Working for the Word, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus.